unexpected circumstances. We had a bit of delay, but we are still uh, holding within you know, academic 15, and I'm really happy for that. And uh, so uh, I want to greet you all on behalf of the Institute of European Studies and uh, really to, to express my great pleasure for having Jim, uh, who is not only a scholar and, as you know, very interesting person with uh, extremely deep and deep knowledge and deep law of America and everything that's happening there, uh, but friend of our people and uh, our uh, nation, uh, which was not very easy, especially in the 90s and after that. It's never been easy, actually. Uh, and of course, uh, I also have to express my gratitude to uh, our dear friend uh, Sergei Tripovic, who has facilitated this event today. Without further ado, uh, Sergio, do you want to say something or? Uh, if you want that, uh, Stefan, you read uh, Whatever you say about uh, Jim may be taken down and used against him, so... <laughs> Just one question, quick question, how do I advance the slide here? Just press the button? Uh, maybe right. Just right. Uh, again, let me apologize for my being late. Can everybody hear me okay? It's not too loud, not too soft, just Goldilocks, right? Okay, good. Um, just to introduce, before I get going, you've seen that cute little picture of Corona Shan here, uh, uh, America's sweetheart and the rest of the world. This is uh, one of the more rated versions. Uh, you may be aware of the fact that we have a number of crises in the United States at the moment. We have, like everybody else, the virus, the lockdown, the economic damage, the, um, the mental health crisis that goes along with that. An awful lot of people that seem to have lost their minds in the whole course of this. Uh, but more immediately, you're also aware, we're connected to that, given that President Trump was in the hospital, that we're having an election in, um, in less than a month now. And of course, everybody asks me, well, who's going to win? Is Trump going to win? What, what's going on? And, and the short answer, of course, is nobody knows. I'm sure, as most of you are aware, we don't have a normal election that you find in other countries where everybody votes and somebody wins. But rather, we have 50 state elections plus the District of Columbia. And with the exception of two states, all of the states give all of their votes, their electoral votes, to the candidate who got the most votes in that state. So um, we. That has a number of effects. One is it effectively disenfranchises more than half the population. In other words, if you're a Republican in California, you might as well not vote because you know California's vote's going to go to the Democrats. If you're a Democrat in Utah, you might as well not vote because. But so there may be about a dozen states where your vote might matter. These are called swing states. Now, one of the problems we have this year is that because of the virus and so much voting by mail, uh, that um, we are likely not to know on election night who actually won. That uh, normally you sit up late on election night or even sometimes not so late and you find out who the winner is. This time we're likely, I don't know how many of you remember Florida in the year 2000 when we didn't know for weeks who won Florida. Picture that happening with five states or ten states where we don't know who the winner is. And that's very likely to occur. Uh, the uh, the uh, other problem we have is that in some of the states, they don't even start counting the ballots, the mail-in ballots, until election day itself. So they will be finding ballots here and finding ballots there that uh, they just now located for weeks after the election. And we can see the, obviously, Trump says it must, it's going to happen, so that means it's a conspiracy theory and a lie. Because anything Trump says is a conspiracy theory and a lie, of course, at least in the, in the mainstream media in the United States. So there's a very strong possibility, I would say, that some states that look like they're being won by Trump on election night will flip to the other side in the, in the weeks that follow. We saw this in 2018 in California where several uh, House districts that had been Republican for many years, in fact, were the only Republican districts left in California, uh, were declared to be Republican wins on election night, 
and then in the weeks that followed over the next month or so, they all flipped one by one into the Democratic camp as they somehow magically came up with ballots that had uh, been you know, in a box somewhere or someplace else that they managed to find and, and vote. So there's a very strong prospect that something really ugly is going to happen in, uh, the, uh, in the United States in the fall. Um, it, on the surface, that's a political crisis. Oh, well, the United States is having a political crisis, but it's really not a political crisis. What it does is it simply will exacerbate, it will be a catalyst for a number of crises that have been, been building up over the years that all seem to be coming to a head uh, right now. Um, which uh, leads me to my, my main theme here, is that uh, there's a strong sense of foreboding, a sense of uh, almost dread building in a number of people in America that something big and bad is coming in our direction. We don't know exactly what it is, but it, it seems to be moving in, in, toward us. Um, and, and, and I hate to disappoint you with this talk because I'm not going to say to you, I know what's really going to happen, you can bet on this, you can bet on this. What I can do is take the dead cat and throw it on the table, let you have a look at it, and say these are the things we're going to be facing, these are some of the factors that go into it, uh, these are some of the possible outcomes that, that could occur, but um, it's really anybody's guess at this point. Um, when we're talking about the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic, what do you want to call it, the riots, the burning, the looting, the mostly peaceful protests, where you see the media say, oh, these protests are mostly peaceful, and you see behind them things burning, buildings and cars burning. CNBC. Uh, CNBC, yes, it's, it's, it's become a, like, a, like a joke in many ways. And then, of course, the, the prospects of an of a uncertain election, the chaos that follows that, um, that we have to understand that these are hitting a number of pre-existing pathologies that, that have built up for a number of years and are maybe moving us towards some kind of a tipping point. That what's the problem that we're going to be facing is not necessarily the, the, the virus or the economic damage or the riots or the election. It's that there are so many other things that have gotten sick in our country for several decades, and they're all coming to a, to a head now. Um, and, and again, some of these we were already starting to see in economic terms and in psychological terms. It, 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 there's an amazing number of disturbed people in America. Now, I'm sure you have the same thing here. Maybe, maybe not as much because you're not as locked down as we are. And I don't know, maybe psychosurgeons are not as psychologically <laughs> prone to these various maladies. Which We've been, been watching all the people. All right, all right. Well, <laughs> I, I, look, I'm a guest in your country. I'm trying to be charitable here, um, and that uh, and there's, and there's a, an interesting paradox we already see that on one hand, where you have this kind of increasingly uh, dissolution or uh, degrading of the social organism of society as a whole, you also see a, a, a strengthening of the mechanisms of government control, of the surveillance state, of monitoring people's activities of uh, limiting free speech. So it, there's a paradox you could say, how can a country be getting both weaker and stronger at the same time? How can the people be getting weaker, but the government is getting stronger? Uh, and uh, even though it, the government itself is going through something of a crisis. And I think this has possible uh, ramifications not only for the disorders and conflict in the United States, but also for uh, the United States presence abroad, which of course would be the greater interest for people here. And, and, and again, we, we don't really know whether this is like the big one, the big earthquake, you know, California falling to the sea or something like that, or whether this is just one of those periodic things that a country goes through uh, every once in a while. There's a couple of researchers named uh, Strauss and Howe who said that about 80 or 90 years, the United States goes through a major crisis. Uh, the first one was during the time of the American Revolution and the War for Independence. The second one was the time of the Civil War, some people call it the Second Civil War, because really the first one was the War for Independence, where you had a, a civil war back at that time between loyalists and, and patriots. The third one was during basically World War I through the Depression and the, uh, and the Second World War, and the third one is now. And, and I think this chart uh, is maybe indicative. Some people say, oh, you're just crying wolf, you're seeing the end is near, blah, blah, blah. Look at the past, look at the past trends, you know, they always go up and say, well, compare that to the life of a Thanksgiving turkey. For about three years, his upward trend line looks really good until you get to Thanksgiving Day and then bam! And the, the past is not necessarily a predictor of the future from the turkey's point of view. So are we nearing Thanksgiving Day? Is the question some people ask. 
Um, you've, you've heard of pre-existing uh, conditions or comorbidities that say if people get uh, COVID-19 are young and healthy, they tend not to die. Whereas if they're like 90 years old and they're already got they're sick and they got diabetes and cancer and everything else, yeah, they're not good candidates to last very long. So I think what we need to do is look at some of the comorbidities that have been affecting the American uh, social organism for some time. Uh, for a long time, the American economy was a production-based economy, especially a manufacturing-based economy. If you look at the time of the revolution, uh, most, uh, most people were self-employed. They were farmers, most of them, some were craftsmen. And of course, then we became a nation of employees, but still in productive industries by and large. You know, yes. you were accelerating. Can you perhaps just slow Well, I'm, I'm making up for a big late. Okay. Right. We're going to look for it. Yes. Well, we're not, we're, we're not doing trans. I, 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 it's my tendency. It's water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's free. Yeah, it's water. Yeah. It's still water. Okay, was it something else before? Thank you. We don't know. Yes, yes there we go. Thank you. All right, I will try to slow down. Um, then we entered a period of what we would call uh, of a service economy, where more and more people were occupied in services where they did something for somebody else. And increasingly now, we've had an economy which we call a financialization economy, that it's less built, built on the production of wealth than of spreading wealth around. And a lot of this also has to do with our place in the world where we have so much coming into our country for decades that are paid for more cheaply than they're really worth because of the dollar's status in the international system. So there's a kind of um, levitation game that's going on here where you have an artificially high level standard of living uh, that is based on broader economic and financial structures that don't necessarily re react uh, reflect the real value of things. You could say, well, that's a benefit, right? People can fly off the hog, they can buy a lot of gadgets from China that you know, don't cost them all that much, and so forth. Yes, that's true, but the price of that is also hollowing out the uh, productive aspects of our economy. So we're buying anything that requires real production, real skill, real manufacturing from other places more cheaply. We don't do those things ourselves anymore. And we've lost that capacity and the wealth producing capacity that that um, implies. Um, everybody's heard about the, uh, the uh, military industrial complex. This is something that President Eisenhower talked about upon, uh, upon leaving office in, uh, in 1961. And uh, to say that there's a military industrial complex just very much understates the problem, that you have a structure of power that has developed even more since that time, which isn't just the arms manufacturers, it's not just the Pentagon, it's not just Congress, it's the financial industry, it's, it's the entertainment industry, it's uh, advertising, it's um, uh, the IT industry. Everything is bound together, I would say, in a big network of power that looks very much kind of like the old Soviet nomenclature. It's a big, dumb dinosaur that does what it does every day. Uh, it produces vast amounts of wealth, not because it produces anything, but because it siphons off wealth from what's left of the productive economy and also from our, our satellites uh, in other countries. Um, so we, and, and, it's, it, and when I say a big dumb dinosaur, it's not something that's really capable of changing its mind in the direct direction. If, if you were, say, a rational political decision maker, you'd get a lot of wise people around the table and say, we've got some problems here. How do we change course? And, and I, I, look, I, I'd like to see a pathway for that to happen, but I can see how it can happen. I can't imagine any group of people who would be powerful enough to fight against the, you might say, the patrimonial interests of all of these people who are, for decades, have been building their lives and their wealth on uh, doing things the way we've always done them. And so, as I say, all those big mansions you see around the Washington suburbs, they don't pay for themselves. They are dependent on structured things being very much as they are. Uh, we're also seeing in our country today um, a, a, a declining levels of public trust, both horizontally and uh, vertically. When I say vertically, everybody hates them, whoever them is, and they all have a different idea of who them is, but there's a, a very strong sense of skepticism of any elite opinion 
nowadays, but at the same time, you also have a horizontal uh, alienation where people on opposite sides uh, of, of the political divides in our country, whether it's, you know, the, the, the uh, it's, it's, oh, it's superficially re reflected in uh, Trump versus anti-Trump, but it's much deeper than that, I think. It's, uh, it's, it's um, that there are, and I'll, and I'll get to some of these fault lines later on in the presentation, but basically that, that the people on the two sides of, of various issues are reflecting just completely different consciousnesses about who they are, who our country is, even what it means to be a human being, and they're not just political adversaries anymore, that they hate each other. That if you look at our previous civil wars, two I would say, that, that the basic assumptions about life, about what's right and wrong, were much less uh, distant from one another than they are today. Um, and again, we'll, uh, we'll mention this later on, is that this also coincides with U.S. geopolitical overextension, that we are still the hegemon of a global system, we are, we are the only country we believe that has genuine sovereignty, and either countries submit to a satellite status, or they get treated as enemies, like uh, Russia and China, or Iran, or Venezuela, that they, they, they don't have the right to have interests other than the ones we can see that they may have, and if they don't accept those limits, well, then they're bad, they're terrorists, they need to be called a revolution, they need to be regime change in one way or another. Uh, we also have to look at the demographic trends in our country. For the first time in America's history, the majority of the population is not married. Uh, and uh, this has never happened before in American history, uh, that there is a declining um, uh, longevity expectations, particularly among the white population. The, the non-white population is not <coughs> in this regard as the white population does. And, and I think this has broader um, consequences for the health of the country as a whole because it's, you know, you, you'll see these uh, Black Lives Matter pro, uh, pro propaganda posters showing all the black and, arm, uh, black and brown arms holding up the country and saying, we built this country, we can burn it down. Mary, you know, America was built by black and brown people. Excuse me, it wasn't. I mean, there <laughs> were a, a, a lot of, a lot of just, first off, the original English settlers and then all the various other immigrant groups from Europe that, that assimilated into that population that has always been the core American ethnos. And, and I think this is something that's completely missing from the American discussion, uh, that we don't really have a concept of an American ethnos, although as I described, I think we could say that there really is one. Um, let's see, uh, the, we also have a, a crisis in, in how power is distributed and exercised in America. I will touch on that later. And then the question of Trump himself. Uh, I had hoped that Trump coming into, not power, because he didn't really take power, but rather into the White House in 2017, maybe possibly could be something like an Octavian, that we have a system that's in crisis. Some parts of the system can't be saved. Some can be saved. Can he do that? And I think it's pretty clear that he can't, that he doesn't effectively control the apparatus of the central government. He will tweet to his subordinates what they ought to do. In other words, the attorney general ought to do this. Well, who's the attorney general's boss? He is. He can just say, do this, do that. He doesn't do it. And maybe one reason he doesn't do it is because whatever he says won't be done. So he, he, he appeals to his base. And of course, a lot of his base says, oh, look what Trump's doing. He's, the attorney general ought to do this. Great, he's getting that done. Well, he's not getting it done. He's just sort of venting because he can't get things done. So we, we have a kind of a, a, a and, I, and I don't want to necessarily put it on Trump's, Trump personally, because he, although he has a very quirky personality, but the, 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 the idea that he ran in 2016 as a counter system candidate and was elected as such uh, to be a great disruptor, but he can, it doesn't seem to be capable of taking that disruption and building it into some alternative direction for our country. Uh, and this is particularly true, I would say, in the area of foreign and defense and military policy, where his appointees have been absolutely horrible. And they've been basically just retreads from the Bush administration, whoever the Republican National Committee gave him. It's indicative that any time anybody leaves his administration, whether it's uh, uh, Bolton or who is the 
Mattis and all the his national security advisor. As soon as they get out, they all turn around and say, what well, a bad guy is and he's not fit to be president. And then you say, well, the in the world did he put you in that job in the first place? If you don't agree with him and you don't even like him, first off, what kind of person would take the job? You know, knowing that you're basically doing that as a deception to the man acting like you're, you're on his team when you're not. But also, why would he not have the awareness? Uh, we know we like to say in Washington, personnel is policy. You get the policy based on the personnel you have. There. And his personnel have been almost uniformly terrible. Um, the, 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 the COVID-19, and I was saying, and on top of that, the, the Black Lives Matter and the, uh, and the uh, Antifa riots, and, and by the way, you hear all the time that, at least from the, the anti-Trump side of the spectrum, that, oh, it's really not BLM, it's really not it's the white supremacists, it's the, it's the Ku Klux Klan, it's all these people doing these things, although, you know, it's, it's not like they're, you know, right-wing white nationalist Trump supporters going around burning that building, it's just not happening. You don't get attacked on the street for wearing a Biden hat anywhere in the country. But if you're wearing a Trump hat and go to some parts of cities, you're going to be attacked. Some people will, will, will attack you. Uh, if you put a yard sign you know, out that says Trump, people will come and smash the sign and maybe do worse to your house. That's not going to happen to you if you have a Biden sign. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any question. The, the violence is coming from the left, but nonetheless, the narrative we get from the establishment is, oh, look, there are a bunch of fascists out there. We better watch out for them. Um, the, uh, again, I, I don't mean to necessarily go through all of this except to say that we have that, uh, the, the, oh, excuse me, I forgot to advance this thing. Okay, um, that, uh, the, the, the attempts of the system to kind of deal with these shocks that are coming from, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter, the Antifa, the, 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 the uh, and so forth, um, are essentially just sort of to double down on the uh, faulty structures that we have. You know, spend trillions of dollars, what, to pro prop up the economy? No, to prop up Wall Street, to make sure that the stock prices keep going up. But a lot of people, you know, the, the, one of the big divisions we have in America today is, are you still getting a paycheck? And that tends to favor the people who are part of the nomenclature. In other words, if you're part of the structure of power, you're still getting paid. You know, my daughter works for Homeland Security, my little Czechista, I call her. And she, uh, and she, uh, she, uh, she's, she's getting paid. She hasn't left her house in months, but she's still getting paid. But a lot of people out there in what we call flyover country, which is the big part of the country between the coasts, where, between where the important people live. The important people all live in the northeast and the coastal eastern cities or on the west coast, and then you have this big kind of silent uh, country in the middle where the regular, normal, working, productive people live, and a lot of them are not getting paid, and um, they're not sure. A lot of small businesses are closing. I, one of the things that people are pointing to is that increasingly the economy is going to be dominated even more and more by giant corporations at the expense of small business, uh, many of which are, are, are closing down. So uh, we, we have that going on. Uh, at the same time, we have a, a government that seems to be incapable of dealing with the larger problem, using the problem, in a sense, as a means of increasing its control. That uh, the, One of the things we find, for example, is that any uh, information on the internet that is in false inter inter uh, information about the virus is now being censored. Uh, and this is, it basically boils down to anybody who disagrees with the World Health Organization or anybody who disagrees with whatever CD says, the Centers for Disease Control say today, because what they said last week was what they're were different when they say today and different from what they say last month. So it's almost like, a, what was the definition of a Soviet historian, someone who can accurately predict the past, that you have to, you have to keep up with what the changing story is, but whatever they're saying right now is the obligatory lie, and nothing else will, will be tolerated. Uh, you have, not so much America, we, we have seen in certain states, Michigan in, in particular, uh, where you know, the police have been very draconian about the lockdown orders, you have to wear a mask, you'll get arrested. They're letting criminals out of jail because they could get sick in jail because the virus could spread in jail. You don't want the poor criminals to get sick, but then they'll take healthy people and throw them in jail 
because they're not following the lockdown order or not wearing a mask or it's something of this sort. This is what our good friend Sam Francis called uh, anarcho anarcho tyranny. It's, it's anarchy for the criminals, it's tyranny for the normal folks. Um, and, as, and as I say, the, there's the, the, uh, the tendency to, to blame the riots on the, not the people who are committing them, but rather on the, uh, on the uh, so called white nationalism, KKK, Nazis, whatever you want to call them, who are essentially non existent. And look, and, and I may be going out of a loop here about post human society, but this is a, a, an idea that's been around for, for quite some time. Who's that? What's that? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought my pants were going to Yeah. Um, you know, there may, I, I don't rule out that some of these trends may have a greater than human intelligence behind them. That, that there are, you know, as, a, as an Orthodox Christian, I, I do believe that there are spiritual trends and realities in the world that can have an influence on human behavior, on human institutions, and there may be some greater thing in the, what is, the scriptures call the mystery of iniquity. There is a tendency of history in a certain direction and that may influence part of what we're doing here. Now, this is, I think, maybe where things may be getting a little bit controversial. I was discussing with some friends, uh, younger fellows, about the questions. Of, you know, a lot of the questions about American identity, ethnicity, race, and language, and all of these things are coming to a, to a head. And, um, Somebody was asking the question, well, what, what, what's, what's, what does it mean to be Japanese? And I said, well, if you respect the emperor and you have a kind of a thing about race and, you know, all the, you, know you, you appreciate good calligraphy and there's a tea making ceremony, I said, no, that's not, that, that's not what makes you Japanese. I can move to Japan, I can learn Japanese, I can say the emperor is great, I can do all of these things, but I still wouldn't be Japanese. These are, these are epiphenomena. These are the things people do because they are Japanese. That is to say, what is primary is the ethnos itself, a self-aware group of people who uh, feel they have something in common, generally starting with common ancestry, but they speak the same language, they practice the same religion, they have the same customs, they have the same moral values, more or less. Somebody can maybe go to that country, depending on the country, and assimilate to those values and eventually become part of that. But that, that's something that is not, not a given. It's just adopting those folk ways, those customs, doesn't make you part of that ethnos. Now, in a country like Japan, it's almost impossible to do that. If any of us moved to Japan and became as Japanese as we ever wanted to be, we would never be accepted as Japanese or Korean or, or Chinese. Um, in America, and then maybe to a to somewhat lesser extent in Europe, we sort of accept that you can do that. Uh, there, you know, there are Germans with French surnames and vice versa. There are people who have, we know their ancestors came from someplace else, but over a couple of generations they assimilated to that country, intermarried with the locals, and, and so on. Now, America has generally been very, very open to that kind of assimilation. And so there has arisen this notion that America is not an ethnic state, that uh, America is just a civic state. We have a bunch of civic principles, and anybody except those principles is an American. For that matter, anybody who doesn't accept those principles as an American as soon as he shows up even illegally in our country. You'll hear again from people that are critical of the idea of a historic American identity that an illegal alien who crosses the border and starts accepting government benefits is a better American than anybody who thinks it's a bad idea. Uh, so this, this is, I, in my mind, it's a sort of a craziness, but what it is, it's a denial of the historic existence of our country. And I've got here the, um, the this uh, statement from John Jay, the Federalist Papers, he was the first uh, Chief Justice of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, that we are one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government. When we look at what we call the civic creed of America, our Constitution and, and all of these things, it is, these didn't come out of thin air. And they were not written by Frenchmen or Spaniards or Chinese or Jews or Greeks or Poles or uh, American Indians or Eskimos. They were written by Englishmen. And they reflected their 150 years of experience as colonists and before that centuries of the development of English common law and, and the ways of government. Um, so it, it was clear to them that there was a core founding ethnos for our country 
and that what they established, as they say, for themselves and their posterity, that's it, for their descendants, they didn't say anybody else who happens to show up, uh, that that's what they thought they were doing based on those values. And then I would say the second why we are not being an ethnic state is that we are a nation of immigrants. Now look, I'm, I'm solely of immigrant uh, 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 origin. I, I was born in the United States, my parents were born in the United States, all four of my grandparents were from Greece, uh, from Sparta. And some people, especially here, say, oh, a Greek friend from America. And I said, no, I'm not your Greek from America. I'm your American friend of Greek origin. And, and so because, and, you know, my grandchildren are only half Greek and so on and so forth. So over a course of two or three generations, these immigrants do assimilate, well, what do they assimilate to? They assimilate to the original founding ethnos. And part of that ethos is that it's an ethos. And by the way, the two words are related, ethos and ethos in Greek. And they both come from the same root as the, Ameri uh, the English word self. They both mean our thing, us. And um, so, and in fact, as, as, uh, as uh, Huntington says here, over the course of three centuries, black people were slowly and only partially assimilated into this culture. And I think, that, I would say, except some of black nationalists, I would say American blacks, African Americans, as they're called nowadays, are a distinct ethnos. And in the same way, you might say that. Uh, actually, it's, I'm, I'm having trouble finding a comparison. I mean, you could say, like in a country like France, that the French are the state-building nation, but you still have Bretons, you have Corsicans, you have Alsatians, you have Basques, but who are part of France, but they aren't the founding ethnos of France. Uh, and, and much the same way, I would say that there is a founding American ethnos. I would say. Black Americans identify as Americans. What else are they but American or Americans of African extraction? But they also have a very strong sense of their own ethnic consciousness. That if you if you to listen to black politicians or listen to black or advocacy organizations, when they say we, we, when they say us, they don't mean Americans as a whole generally. They mean us, our people, and that's I think perfectly natural in many respects, but at the same time, immigrants from Western, Southern, and Eastern Europe were more fully assimilated, people like me and my, my, my forebears. And so we added to the culture a little bit, you know, it's accepted that, okay, of course, many Americans might have not only English last names, but Italian or Greek or Polish, but they're still accepted as, as Americans. Part of our problem is maybe we don't even have a word for this. Uh, that in, in Russia, for example, you can be Ruski, meaning you're an ethnic Russian, you're one of the state building ethnos, but you're also a Sisi or anybody who's indigenous to Russia. And we don't have a word for that, we just call them both Americans. And I, I think we should call the ethnic Americans Americans. But uh, I don't know if that's going to kind of catch on. Um, that's sometimes used as, as a, as a uh, derogatory. So yes, would, yes, uh, yes. Would you agree that in the same way that white Americans assimilate to the core ethnos, the core of the Saxon ethnos, that the same things happen with, let's say, a third generation African immigrants who came from Africa? Do they assimilate within the African American ethnos? Yes, yes, they do. Yes, they do. And often, and often interestingly, and often interestingly, there's some friction between the indigenous African Americans and the immigrant Africans. Because they saw that in Wisconsin with the Somalis. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 They, they often do not like each other very much. And now maybe after a couple generations that goes away. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that our first black president, Barack Obama, was not an African American. He was an African American. That is to say, his father was from Africa, his mother was a white American. And if uh, Joe Biden wins and Kamala Harris becomes our, our real president then, uh, she will be the next African-American who's not an African-American either. Yeah, in Indian Jamaican. Indian Jamaican, yeah. So it's, uh, it, we still yet have to have a, a, a real African-American as president. So, um, yes, it is, but I, I think you're right about that, that the assimilation of most Africans, uh, African immigrants is to the African-American community rather, and again, it's, I, I don't know that that's something that can be changed, but that's, I think that's descriptive. Um, I, I, I think what we're left with is, as this quote says on the top, and we, we all know the concept of ethnogenesis, how does a nation come into being. You also have to, have to wonder how, does, how do nations end, how do they cease to exist. I mean, history is full of the names of ethnic that once existed that no longer do. And you know, someone who wrote, um, I don't even know who the guy is, America is a corpse being consumed by maggots. Liberals are rooting for the maggots, conservatives are rooting for the corpse. So American uh, conservatives are basically trying to preserve the facade 
of a structure that is based on an ethnic uh, core that has been increasingly weakened and those structures do not work anymore, but all they can think of is civic nationalism preserve the structures, whereas then on the other side, you have people who say, burn it all down, that we're a fundamentally evil country, we're founded on slavery, racism, genocide of the Indians, that, um, you know, uh, patriarchy, smash the patriarchy, all of these things, which are attacking both the ethnos and the ethos of that ethnos. And so, you know, that, that would be the maggot party. Um, and this also results, for example, in de-Christianization. Not only did I mention that you know, for the first time, most Americans are not married. It's, we're not a majority yet, but we have a much, uh, very fast-growing um, plurality of Americans who are, re report their religion as none. Uh, that what is your religion? None. And uh, this is particularly true among young people, that the passing on of religion, no matter what religion they are, uh, is, is not, uh, has not um, gone very well. So you have a lot of people that are just simply consumers who don't believe much of anything. By the way, I, I know my generation, the baby boom, gener gen baby boom generation, everybody likes to beat up on because we're so uh, indisciplined and uh, self-indulgent and all that stuff. Generations after us are a lot worse. Of course, we raised them, so we have to be a good reason for that. I mean, it's amazing. If you talk to most young Americans today and ask them, um, who was on which side in World War II? They have no idea. If you ask them, well, which nation on July 4th, Independence Day, who did we get our independence from? The South? They, they have no idea. What year was it? 1979? They, they just don't know. And they, they've been basically lobotomized. You, you're looking for a new Soviet man, except this new American, uh, you know, who is it? Uh, Bubis uh, Americanos, that uh, Mencken called it. And he, he's sort of a blank slate for whatever trash is on Twitter or TikTok, uh, that the younger generation is becoming that, that blank slate and with no historical memory and certainly no ethnic memory. Um, and this, I think, uh, has um, consequences for the, the, the civic stability of the country uh, in that, uh, that as, as Americans drift apart and don't share the same assumptions about life, as I said, said earlier, they become enemies. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the former longtime strongman of, uh, of uh, Singapore, said that if you have a stable identity at the majority of the country, people vote for the economic interest, they vote for political philosophy, if you don't have that anymore, they vote for the tribe. In America, we have many tribes today. Not just ethnic tribes, but sexual tribes and linguistic tribes and what kind of um, immigration status do you have? Who, we have? who do I define myself as? As a black person, a white person, a gay person, a transgender person, as a, as a climate change activist, whatever it might be, and that's the tribe I'm voting for. Uh, so you see this greater atomization of uh, society. So I, I think what we can say is that uh, and, uh, and this is uh, what am I quoting me here? Is that? <laughs> I must be a smart guy. Uh, <laughs> that, that I would say American policy is no longer about a range of governing styles. It's not about, well, should we spend more or less on welfare programs? It's about what country we want to be and how do we define ourselves as Americans or do we define ourselves as Americans at all? Is that a, a dead concept anymore? Can we say that we like to say this experiment in democracy. Of course, the founding fathers never intended to create a democracy. At what point do we say the experiment has failed? Now, this has, shifting over a little bit, this has ramifications for foreign affairs, especially for our policy of the last few decades. That, as again, Huntington pointed out, the efforts to define national interests presuppose agreements on the nature of the country whose interests are being defined. National interests derive from national identity. We have to know who we are before we can know what our interests are. Um, you would think in a, in a normal country, and, and I would say, despite what sort of just said about uh, Mr. Vujic, you're still relatively a normal country. You start with the notion that we're Serbs, this is Serbia. What are Serbia's interests? I mean, it's very, very doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, really. We are yeah. also tribalizing at least our elite very yeah. strongly. But you don't, don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's, uh, but generally, yeah. I, I, I would say maybe, I, I'm not saying initially your leadership, but 
but I would hope that most serves still have a yeah. sense of being yeah. served. That's true. Yeah. Yes. That's true. Whereas Americans, I think that's that's less and less true, except the extent to which you have people who think of themselves as conservatives, but their conservative essentially is flag waving. I, you know, I stand by the Constitution. I have a Second Amendment right to carry a weapon. So they have they have a sense of civic concepts that they associate with their country. That's what their patriotism consists of. And they said, yeah, that, but those are the principles of Americans. What does it mean to be an American? And they would not, even they would not have an answer for you. I mean, when I was a kid, if you told Americans we were not a nation, they would punch you in the nose because they had a very strong sense of nation. You know, my, my, my parents growing up as the children of foreign immigrants also had a sense of, yeah, we're born here Americans, but they're different. You know, if, if a Greek girl married somebody who wasn't Greek, oh, she married an American boy. In other words, they knew he was an ethnic American. Today, that concept is totally lost of an ethnic American. Uh, and, and, and that, I think, it means that since we don't have a unified national concept of our country and therefore what its interests are, you essentially have two things going on. One is corporate interests, transnational corporate interests, speak very loudly in American politics. And the other one is um, sub-national uh, ethnic interests. And those could be of two varieties. It could be ethnic communities from the United States, the United States and it could also be various foreign lobbies. If you look, for example, on the House of uh, Representatives page and look at, there's a list of foreign caucuses. And these are like the, the Azerbaijan caucus, the, uh, the Armenia caucus. They're like at least three Israel caucuses and some Greek caucuses. And, you know, almost every, every ethnic lobby you can think of, including its foreign government, has a thumb in the thigh for American policy. And you start to say, okay, well, we're Greek, Greece and Turkey, or uh, Israel and Iran, or whoever the various countries might be, what's the American interest? You might as well be speaking Chinese. They don't know what you're talking about. The, the, to them, American interest is the sum of the policies, with all these little interests having their, uh, their, their uh, pull on the string. But I say, what is the American interest here? It would, it would be almost an alien concept to ask people in politics today. And that's where you get this idea that we, have, uh, we invade the world. We are the world. We are the world embryo. We're the embryo of the world state. Since we don't have a nation of our own, anybody can come on in and be American at the same time. We'll help ourselves to Americanize all the rest of you. As, as, as Wesley Clark once told somebody at Pentagon, what the rest of the world really wants deep down they all want to be Americans. They all want to be Americans. And I think that that kind of lurks behind the thinking of our policymakers that, well, what we have is, is, is ready for export. And it's, it, in a way, I, it, it gets back to what I said about the nomenclatura. The analogy to the Soviet Union is, I think, very strong as well, whereas the Soviet Union's nomenclatura structure was based on an ideology that had an international program, peace, progress, socialism. Well, we have one too, democracy, human rights, and free markets. And everybody must have democracy, human rights, and free markets as we define democracy, human rights, and free markets. And if you go along with that, you're one of our good friends and probably a satellite because we then control your financial system, we control your military, we control your intelligence service, or, oh, well, then you're bad, you're a dictatorship. You would need to be changed. So you could have you could have a box of condoms and a bag of money, or you could have uh, bombs and sanctions. That's your choice. So that's the way we tend to put, we we tend to tend to have this kind of Manichaean uh, attitude of the world. You're either a satellite or you're an enemy. We don't have much in between. You know, back during the first Cold War, we used to have neutrals. Remember them? They were great. Uh, they were you know Finland and Austria and maybe Yugoslavia. I guess was uh, considered more or less a neutral, wasn't it? Not a lot. Yeah, not a lot. There you go. See, that was respectable in those days. Now it's not respectable. Um, and uh, and I would say, saving the world through degeneracy. Uh, this is a line from Confederacy of Dunces, if anybody has, has read that. That it, 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 I don't think it's accidental that uh, a big part of America, and even worse, by the way, European policy, is the um, advocacy of sexual pathologies. Uh, basically, uh, why is LGBT such a huge thing? We want to impose on uh, on the rest of the world. Why is you know we we've got a new campaign under the Trump administration to decriminalize homosexuality in Africa. How in the wide world of sports is that an American interest? What's that got to do with the United States? Well, it's human rights. 
Well, you know, maybe it's human rights, maybe it isn't, but why? And especially, we do it, by the way, in Christian countries and in Eastern European countries. Everybody knows, and all polling data shows this, that the countries that formerly had been communist are a lot more conservative in their social values than the Western European countries. So we have these, these propaganda campaigns to, you know, have rainbow uh, flags and, and pride parades all over Eastern Europe, especially. You notice we don't do this in the Middle East. Was that a rhetorical question, right? Or no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. it wasn't rhetorical. I'm going to answer. The answer is, I think, it's become part of the mechanism of social control. It's part of breaking down the identity and morals of these other countries so they're more easily controlled. But I think it also reflects the fact that our elites firmly hold these values. And in their minds, you can't have democracy without these values. That's all I like to say. There's no transatlanticism without transgenderism. And uh, so that these, this is a, a package of both international influence and also of, uh, of these so-called values. And, and, and I think that leads us back to Trump and what's at stake in this, in, in this uh, election. Trump, I think, is hated and loved, not so much by what he's done, but what he symbolizes. He's kind of like a Warshock blot. Of, uh, you see him, he's, he's either Orange Hitler or he is uh, some kind of a representative of the America we all thought we grew up in. He's a little strange, you know. But when, he, when he shoots his mouth off and says outrageous things, his, his base loves it all the more. They, they, that's one of the things they like. But yeah, he's really telling them the way things are. You know, the, the Narod loves that. You know, so it's, uh, it, but it, 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 he, so maybe in the sense that if he is not removed, is there some possibility this ethnos could somehow recover itself? Maybe. But if he goes, what it means is the other side will, I, I believe, have total control of the levers of power and be able to conduct a long against what's left of the American ethnos and its, and its ethos. Um, so, let's get into some of the scenarios of what we're looking at. Uh, maybe, maybe all this stuff we're doing to deal with the virus and, and try to deal with the, um, the, uh, the disorders, maybe it all work, maybe everything calms down, maybe everything goes back to normal, and there is no crunch, there is no Thanksgiving day. Um, Maybe, I don't know. We can all, we can all get lucky. Uh, maybe there's prospect of, uh, of international war. Uh, that, you know, the story was, I guess about, I guess it was June of last year, we were 10 minutes away from attacking Iran. This is the time when the Iranians shot down our, our drone, which they said had gone into their territory. And supposedly only when TV show host Tucker Carlson called up Trump personally to ask him not to do it, did he back off doing it? Because the whole machinery of the U.S. military has going into, into motion to begin an attack on Iraq. Uh, the, the fact that um, Trump has appointed to his administration only people who are agreed with all the mistakes of the last 30 years that he denounced during the campaign in 2016 means that really nothing much has changed. I want to get out of Syria. Except we never get out of Syria. I want to get out of Iraq, but we don't get out of it. You think he's the commander in chief of the armed forces? You can say, General, I want to, I want to plan getting out, get him out of it in 30 days. That's an order. I don't know if he knows he can even do that. Uh, that he has that authority. Is there anybody around him he has that authority? That he talks about the building the border wall, which he actually has begun to make some progress on. Does he know he can say to the army, General, go secure the border, and they will do that? I don't know if he's ever been told this. Or if he, he did tell them, would they actually follow those orders? And this is the part of the problem, too. He doesn't have control of the apparatus of government. Uh, there's been a certain kind of a hijacking of uh, his America First agenda. Well, what he really meant was uh, to make America great, <coughs> make NATO great. Uh, that, that somehow that simply making demands of our satellites to pay more money, all that burden sharing stuff we've been talking about for decades, that's what he really meant. Uh, and what we see is uh, as much or more as was the case during the Obama administration, this game of provocation and chicken against the Russians in the Black Sea and the Baltic, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Ukraine, now whatever is going on in Belarus. We do the same thing with the Chinese in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. Places where America, if you were looking at it very narrowly, really doesn't have a lot in the way of national interest. But
but they insist on pushing on these. We're, we, we, have, we recognize who the real president of Venezuela is, not the whoever won an election in Venezuela, because we say it wasn't valid. It'd be interesting to say what all these countries will say when we're in a prolonged crisis later this year. Will they, will they get to pick who the valid president of the United States is? So um, there, there are a couple possibilities here. Do, do we end up as our as our uh, national uh, health declines being forced to pull back from our international commitments and against this uh, very forward hegemonistic attitude toward other powers? Or do we even uh, double down on it? Do we get ourselves caught in what is the uh, Thucydides, I should have the Greek issues, the Thucydides, 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 clock. Thucydides, Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, where we have to take the Chinese down while they're still strong, we're still stronger than they are. It, have we already passed that line? Uh, there, there are a lot of people in our military, I think the Brookings Institution ran a few war games a few years ago with an American war against Russia and China, and we did not do very well. Uh, you know, we've got a great apparatus with like our aircraft carriers for pounding other little countries that cannot respond to great platforms for being up on Somalia or something. But uh, if there were, we had what they call a, uh, uh, a, peer, a peer competitor, a country that was more or less of the same military status as we are, uh, and that uh, we, especially if we didn't have air superiority somewhere, we'd be in a world of hurt. And all those carriers, you know what those are called? Those are called targets. Uh, that, that they'd be taken out in the first five minutes of war, that either in swarms or even if it comes down to nuclear weapons. And uh, so that, that danger is there. I've been mean, you know, talking to people in both Moscow and in Washington about, you know, you know the, what is it, the doomsday clock is set closer to midnight than it ever has been. All of the arms control agreements with Russia are systematically being disassembled. So all the things to build uh, confidence to prevent any accidental outbreak of hostilities have been uh, very much broken down during not just this administration, but the previous ones. And there's also something else there, particularly toward the Russians, but now building with the Chinese, a total lack of respect. I mean, you never, even during the height of anti, the Red Scare and anti-communism, during the 1950s, for example, you never saw the vilification of the Soviet leadership the way you do with the Russian leadership today. Never Brezhnev, never Khrushchev. Not even Stalin was treated the way Putin is in the American media. Just, just total demonization. Uh, and I think part of that is the fact that in, during the first World War with the Soviet Union, the peace movement was mostly on the left because a lot of them were kind of sympathetic to the communism. I didn't like their methods so much, but they kind of liked that they were socialist and they wanted to do nice things for people, even if they meant you know, killing some people. Um, but you don't have that now, and it's interesting that the, the Russophobia that dominates American politics is most strong on the left. And by the way, Biden wins. It's going to be Katie bar the door in terms of what his team, I don't know if that's question of transfer. So, Watch out that, that you think that Pompeo and some of these people are, are very, very harsh when it comes to the Russians. It would be 10 times worse if Biden had said that these people like Nick Burns or uh, Michelle Flournoy or Edward Farkas, yeah, Farkash and all the rest of them. So it's, it's going to get worse. And look, there's a theory that in the international system, these things uh, come around every so often. If you look at, you know, the, the, the sort of the cycle of European history from the Thirty Years' War into the wars of the 18th century, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, and then the two world wars of the 20th century. We're about due uh, for another big one. And uh, you, you'd like to think that we learned some lessons from the past, so uh, we know that has been. Um, I'm going over time. Okay. Uh, ba back to, back to the, the, the domestic politics of America. Um, if, um, if, if, if if Trump loses, and I don't know, there's, there's a lot of people I know who think he's going to win, he's going to win big, there's going to be a red tsunami, if they call it, and all of this, and I'm kind of skeptical. Even if he does actually win, I don't think it'll be a big win, and unless it's a really big win, it's likely to be stolen from him. There's even talk with this thing called the Transition Integrity Project, which is a lot of uh, mostly former officials, but with very good contacts within. Current uh, official government in the military that 
If Trump tries to steal the election, not leaving office after he lost, the military will force him to leave, which really means if there's a disputed election or if he's really won, but it wasn't by a decisive amount, we can accuse him of stealing the election and force him to leave office. Uh, that's, yeah, that's the thing, too. Or it could be a coup d'etat, actually, more plastic. Yeah, it could be a form of a coup d'etat, or it could, be, um, it could be the form of a killer revolution. We don't know how it would really play out. And we well, can't, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. If you go by the Belarusian experience, all that Biden needs is to win 10%. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he'll do better than that. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly right. Now, of course, in Belarus, that's being uh, that's being supported from the outside. But what's interesting is that the institutions that are supporting the, and have supported the cover. You know, this is October fifth, after all. <laughs> is that uh, that that the uh, the institutions, both in the government, the agencies, and also the NGOs, you know, the solar organization, many others that have uh, supported these color revolutions in other countries are the same ones supporting them here in the United States. It's the same apparatus, and some people have pointed out with respect to Ukraine, some of the same individuals who are involved in the Maidan are involved domestically in the United States in the incipient coup against Trump. It's the same methodology, the same apparatus, some of the same people. Uh, and as you know, part of this is, um, well, you can already see this with the Black Lives Matter and uh, the uh, Antifa stuff going on. It's not about racism. It's not about police behavior. It's about the uh, desire to replace one ruling apparatus, or, or, or let me say that differently, because it's the same ruling apparatus that really does already control the deep state, to simply uh, seize all of the levers of power, including the presidency, which is still, at least in principle, in the hands of the target ethnos that is slated for destruction. So, um, and, and this is where we get to the question of what will happen uh, that, if, they, if Trump loses, or, or, or even if he wins and then he is, is taken out of office, or for that matter, even if he wins and manages to hold on for another four years, I don't see how another Republican ever gets elected after him. That the demographic trends, in, and remember what I said at the beginning about different states, once Texas becomes a majority uh, Latino state, it's all over. Republicans will never win another election. If you look at the voting blocks in the United States, uh, Republicans give Republicans get about 90% of the black vote. We get about two Democrats. Oh, sorry, Democrats get 90% of the black vote. Republicans get about 10%. Trump says he might get another couple percentages. We'll see. Uh, Republicans get about a third of the of Latino vote and about a third of the Asian vote. Interestingly, they get more of the Asian of the Latino vote than they get of the Asian vote. Even though the Asians are a lot richer than the Latinos, they don't vote Republican in the same numbers as Latinos do. And that's probably because there are more religious Latinos, or more very strongly Christian, Catholic, or evangelical uh, Hispanics who will vote for the Republicans for those reasons. And then, then the Republicans generally get between around 65% of the white vote. Um, and if it's below 65, generally they lose. If it's above 65 or 70, then they're likely to win. But see, that percentage that they must win the white vote gets to be more and more every year as the demographics change. So, you know, pretty soon they'll have to be not only 70%, 75%, 80%, and that's not sustainable because you're, you're going to have a certain percentage going to say, well, they, you know, they maybe ethnically belong to the, you know, majority of those, but I'm going to vote for the Democrat because I'm gay, or because I'm a feminist, or because I'm a climate, whatever it may be. You know? So, uh, and you don't find that as much in the, in the minority communities. And of those military tribes, white people don't want to vote as tribal. So, what you're likely to end up with is what I call at some point the dictatorship of the victims. And, and if you look at the chart, in a way, this is kind of a you know, you've heard of cultural Marxism where you take the Marxist paradigm between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, but it has many more factors than simply what's your economic status. Is that uh, you, you have sex, you have uh, race, language, religion, all of these things are dichotomies where you have a, a oppressor class and a victim class. And the, uh, the, the uh, white, heterosexual, Christian males are representatives of all the oppressor groups. And by the way, when you look at what's called intersectionality, that uh, the weakest victim group are white women and they're also the biggest target demographic for both parties. Because the Democrats know that a lot of white women don't like Trump because he's a mean man, he talks, you know, in a rough way and so forth. So they don't like him, although 
they may feel that he represents their interests in any number of ways, but they won't vote for him because he's mean. And also, there's a sense, too, that don't you have to support your sisters of color? You know, that you know, basically we have to appeal to our solidarity with other victim groups who have more victim points than we do. So uh, that's why, for example, in many of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, even more so with Antifa, you see a lot of white females out there supporting them because they want to show how caring they really are uh, in supporting social justice, uh, even though it may not be in their particular interest to support any of those uh, causes. Uh, so virtual signal. Virtual, virtual signal. And by the way, virtual masking has become part of it. I mean, wearing a mask has become almost a, a, a display on whether you're one of the good guys or one of the bad guys. You'll see people driving in a car by himself or, or herself, more likely, wearing a mask, all by yourself in a car. Whom are you protecting? From whom? You, but you do see it. And so uh, there's going to be uh, burning of masks uh, comparable, uh, comparable to burning of bras. <laughs> <laughs> It's possible. Look, look, if anybody wants to wear a mask, I can understand it's a personal precaution. That's, you know, that, that's something you can do. But the, the kind of the hatred, the hostility you see towards somebody who doesn't wear it. And, and also, the wearing it when you don't need to wear it, when you're not even near another person, when you're out, outside on a street, miles away from another person, whom are you protecting? Well, that just come yeah. the birds. Practicing recycling the germs. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, in, in any case, uh, so I think we're, we're that was, so that's the direction we're going toward the dictation of the victim. Now, will that, will that happen? Will there be uh, a fight? And uh, opinions in the United States are all over the place here. Um, you, you know, they're, they're, first off, as you all know, in America, we like our guns. And you know, where I live in Virginia and many other states, I would say about 35 states, they have what is called open carry which means if you're carrying the weapon unconcealed, if you're wearing it on your hip or carrying a long gun in your hand, you don't need a permit for it. You don't need any paperwork at all. Uh, you don't need a license to own a gun in most places, or you don't need to register it. And if you want to carry it around, as long, as long as folks can see it, you don't need a permit for that either. If you want to keep it in a holster hidden, then you need a permit for that. But most states now have what they call must issue, which means that if you apply for the permit, they must grant the permit unless you have a criminal record or something like that. Uh, it used to be in some states, and still is in some states, they would not issue it unless you could show them a very good reason that some bureaucrat agreed with. And now there's been a movement against that. But anyway, this would be one of the uh, big uh, targets. Of the bottom line is Americans are generally pretty well armed. Um, that there, the next thing is there can be, I'm sorry, did you have something? Yeah. You can, you can think of one in particular, right? He's <laughs> <laughs> the expert. You were thinking that. Right? Yeah, yeah. expert. Um, yeah, yeah. Thwarting surveillance. Will there be some effort for people to get out of, uh, given that part of what we're going to be seeing here is, a, and we haven't been seeing it already, is the uh, purging of uh, dissident views from online. Not only to the virus information, but, uh, like, for example, I, I used to, uh, I, I've been doing much writing recently, but I used to do writing, a lot of writing with something called the Strategic Culture Foundation. You cannot now tweet a link from SCF. And if you tweet it, it will block the link. And YouTube yeah. is, is, is censoring so many. Yeah, yeah exactly. Channels. Yeah, yeah. So, it basically, it, it basically, what they're looking at for two, you know, is for two things. It is um, Russian propaganda and anything that, pretty much anything is Russian propaganda now and hate speech. And since we know that the boss of Orange Hitler is the bigger Hitler in the Kremlin, they sort of merge together. That, in fact, Hillary Clinton was very big on saying this, that Putin is the leader of the neo-Nazi alt-right conspiracy. Uh, this is, this is, you know, I think a lot of people on the anti-Trump side of the spectrum, mostly the left, actually believe all of this. And it's become now something that's, uh, when you see, uh, politicians lecturing the tech giant CEOs, saying, why are you do, doing more to clean up hate on your platform? Mm -hmm. What they're really saying, we want more censorship. And of course, they're only too happy to give them what they want. Um, you hear a lot of talk, and they, like, you can Google it, they, you know, that, that we're, Google, he's one of the most Columbia offenders. Don't do Google, do duck, duck, go. That's what I want. That a lot of talk about a, a civil war, that we're already in a cold civil war, and the question is, can it get hot? Uh, now, some people say if Trump loses, his people will go out onto the streets. I don't expect that to happen, because these are very, very law-abiding people. 
you know, and what would they do? Go down, go down to the corner and burn down the post office? What would they vent their anger against? Whereas the other side is very, very well organized and, and knows how they would use life. Now, if people actually started to fight, will the, the Americans that, let, let's just say that the people who support Trump have a lot more guns than the people who don't. The people in the, the only chance. Yeah, the only, the only chance he has. Now, it's a civil war, right? If, if, well, it's it's conceivable, and and, and that's obvious. And especially since if, if a civil war did come, it would not be like the our, our, the one in 1861, 65, nice armies of uniformed states. It would be more like the Russian Civil War, Spanish Civil War, maybe even in some ways like the break of Yugoslavia. So the so so post-apocalyptic. Uh, like yeah, Mad Max, all yeah, that kind Mad of Max, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 2021. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Uh, the Mad Max film was in 2021. Yes. The, the yes. series was... Tick-tock, tick-tock. Yeah. <laughs> We're about time. Blade yeah. Runner was yeah. in 2019. Also. It, it, it also, keep in mind, too, if, 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 if we did have this kind of political breakdown and then, yeah. and then maybe yeah. civil conflict, what happens to the economy? What happens to the supply chains? Uh, the cities? What happens when trucks don't go to the cities anymore delivering food? You know, can they send out punitive attachments to the countryside like the Bolsheviks did? I don't think so. So, uh, we, you know, there are a lot of other factors that we can't really foresee if this uh, starts to... And, oh, and by the way, we already see many, many people leaving the cities and going out to, to rural areas. I have a friend who lives in Manhattan, and he said, just moving vans everywhere. People are getting out of the cities. I know some other people lived in Chicago, and because people were being attacked on the streets near where they live, in the nice, you know, in the loop area. Of Chicago, they, they got out and uh, they moved back to Northern Virginia, which is still relatively safe. So, there's a, what so many people call this the big sort, where people, well, what happened in Yugoslavia during the wars here? Even, even our gym, gym they were yeah. up to COVID, started massively people from Berlin, and now it's all yeah. buying the houses all around yeah. the, the, the Serbia. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. Well, and, so and, it's and, it's and really so, happening anyway. And, and of course, here in Serbia, a lot of people still know where their home village is, and they yeah, still have some yeah. relatives there, and say, well, worst comes worst, I'll go back there. Yeah. If you ask most Americans, where are you going to go back to? They have no idea. They have no ancestral hey, well, Mexico. <laughs> Mexico. Well, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, now, there's some people on the right who welcome all these trends and say that, uh, that, they're, that this will bring us to a civil war and gave good guys will win, and they often tend to look at this through a racial lens. And some people both applaud this and some people deplore it and say, oh, this you know, will turn into a race war. And that's part of the problem I identified earlier without having a clear concept of an American ethnos, because if you can't think in terms of an American ethnos, then who are we? They'd say, well, then I guess it's white people. Right? So it, it, it looks like if you get thrown into an American prison. Uh, um, some, some people, some, some people can, can, can tell you what that's like. I can't. But there's... Uh, there's because you refuse to take the call. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a long story. it's a long story and I, st I, I, I still apologize for that. But anyway, if you get thrown into an American prison, you basically are a member of a white gang, a Hispanic gang or a black gang, where you're dead, or at least you get raped, and it's, that's just the way it or, is. Or, yeah. I, uh, or you get to beat the big black boss in, in chess, chess. Yes. and you're called the who knows the game. Yes, yeah. Well, you, you, yeah. You, you, you're the only white guy in there, right? Uh, that, there was another guy. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> But anyway, it's important yes. to avoid yes. that you have to be you have a rape. Yes. 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 Well, if he had lost the chess game. Clearly. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, two, two, two. So, <laughs> so, to wrap up, as, as I say, does Thanksgiving Day come? Does the big crunch come, come? Does the big collapse come? I think it will. I don't know what form it will take. Maybe it won't come, but I, I think something big and ugly is coming this way, and we don't know what it is. And the, I, as I say, I think the triggering event is likely to be something here through the, um, the um, <clears throat> because of what happens, disorders following the election. There is a uh, big potential for false flags here. Uh, and we know that very, very well from the way other regime change operations have run. A good friend of mine is a former state senator from Virginia, uh, Senator Richard Black, 
decorated uh, combat veteran from Vietnam, Purple Heart, and all that stuff. Worked for many years in um, uh, judge advocate group in, uh, in, uh, in the military. That's, he's a jurist, a lawyer. And he says that there's a lot of evidence that the other side is in a position to mimic an electronic attack on our election and make it look like the Russians or the Chinese did it. So even if Trump is reported to the win winner, they'll say, wait, this is the result of interference. And the intelligence community can show that the, the Russians were behind it. And so that the then when the military goes to remove Trump from office, even all the people in the military, the rank and file, who generally are pro-Trump, will say, oh, we have to stop this Russian, this Russian uh, coup that's taking over our country. So the people carrying out the coup will think that they're stopping the coup. I mean, this, this, is, not a, uh, this is not unheard of. You'll remember during the plot to kill Hitler uh, that the people who thought they had assassinated him were claiming to be the people who were stopping the coup that had killed Hitler when they themselves were perpetrators. And then when it turned out to be lied, well, things went down from there. But so there's the, the possibility of a false flag and, and all of this. Uh, as I say, the, um, if, if there is any kind of uh, uh, civil conflict issues like uh, uh, coordination, like chain of command, leadership, all of these things will be extremely important. The anti-Trump people are very organized, well-funded, and well-led. The pro-Trump people are not. Um, they do have a lot more guns. Whether that will matter or not, I don't know. Uh, they have a very uh, poor sense of identity, as I said. They either think in civic terms or some of them in racial terms. They don't have a really strong sense of, of, of an ethnic identity. Um, if there is a conflict, will the nomenclatura split? Uh, Alexander Stromos came up with the concept of the second pivot, that a revolutionary situation that some other pivot of authority always appears and becomes where people then gravitate to their loyalty from the old sense of, uh, source of authority to the new source of authority. So in the French Revolution, it was from the king to the first state, which became the National Assembly, or the, the Soviet too, from the, the, uh, the uh, provisional government from Petrograd Soviet, and so forth. So will somebody, will be maybe the possibility that if there's a contested election, like we've seen in other countries, maybe Trump and Biden both declare themselves to be the real winner. Neither one of them concedes, and we have people saying, I follow President Trump, no, I follow President Biden. Um, if there is a war, if it does look like a, a war like a, a Yugoslav or a Spanish or a Russian civil war, I think it could be very, very bad because I don't think the moral limits on people's behavior are very strong once we cross a certain threshold. So that's, that's sort of what I leave, like, I leave, leave you, like I said, with more questions than answers. The only thing I would add, on a positive note, is that um, sometimes you, you, you maybe you look at, well, actually, why don't you tell the story first about the Shafari that you told you? Oh, right. Yes. Uh, in 98, I went to Moscow with the former editor of Chronicles magazine, Tom Clement, and we had the dinner with the late lamented Pierre Shafarevich. Uh, probably not most of you. And it was a terrible time in Russia. Uh, the, the currency was collapsing, the babushkas were begging at petrol stations, and uh, uh, it was a society in, in utter disarray. And Tom asked Shafarevich if there was a chance for Russia to recover from this uh, collapse. And, and he replied uh, as follows As a mathematician, who likes to deal with executives, I can't put together a model of recovery, which would be empirically based. But as an Orthodox Christian who believes in the beneficial intervention of the Holy Spirit, I know it's possible and therefore imminent. And uh, I would only add that the one area where I uh, might disagree with James' analysis, and it is otherwise everything you said I may subscribe to, is the behavior of the military and, and police mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the possibility that even though their top brass are politicized and uh, promoted on the basis of political loyalty to all of these post-human concepts, that in fact it would be very hard to force uh, the rank and file 
to obey orders which would include fighting the good old boys with pickup trucks and, and market hats. And uh, we had a discussion about that uh, about four months ago. My son, who is now in Marine Reserve, he used to be in active duty, and uh, he's firmly of the opinion that knowing the inside of, of uh, the group of spirit and what is after all still the elite arm mm -hmm. of, of the American Armed Forces, that uh, the bad guys, the, the Wesley Clarks of this world, wouldn't be able to pull it off. So, and then, I'm sorry, may, yeah. may I have just, just an addition to it because it's uh, exactly connected. And nice to see you, James, after some time. Yes. Uh, now, just recently, I went through the list of the, of the paratroopers of the 173rd Brigade that jumped into Vietnam in, in mm -hmm. Operation uh, mm, Taxi Junction. Okay, it was one battalion of 173rd, so which is currently in Vicenza, okay, in, uh, in Italy. So maybe one in 10 or one in 15 was of the Hispan origin. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the list of those who jumped in 2003 in Tigrit. Mm -hmm. Same brigade, just full brigade, not only one battalion, but okay, approximately 1,000 soldiers. One in 10 was not Hispan. One in ten was not. not exactly. So one in ten was not Hispano American. Wow. Which means that the elite urban force of the United States, which is a base, base uh, unit in, uh, in yeah. Europe, is com almost completely uh, Hispano American. Unit. So it was the Spanish Inquisition against Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody expects that. <laughs> well, see, and I'm not sure Serge and I are disagreeing here. I think the, the heart and the mind of most of the people would be on, if I can say it this way, the American side. Um, the, uh, the this is where I think the issue of deception will come in, is that you might not be able to force them to do something, but you might be able to fool them into something. If they think they're doing something that other than what they're really doing. And look, and this is where I do hold out some grounds for optimism. America is a big country. It's full of tens of millions of very normal people, hardworking people, uh, productive people whose heart is in the right place. Uh, not always their brain is in the right place, but their heart is in the right place. And that um, you, if I am serious about the idea of an ethnos as kind of a macro organism, that it does have its own rhythm, its own life, its own degree of health, and maybe it's not as healthy as it used to be as it should be, but maybe it's healthier than we think, maybe than we know, and somehow manages to you know, I don't see the pathway, I don't see the mathematical pathway, but maybe something I don't see happens because the health of that organism somehow manages to sustain itself. So that's maybe what I know. And well, the Holy Spirit, too, that could not hurt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, things are moving, 
And I mean, they were smart guys, but but then at the end, I, I'm not sure really. <laughs> it's true, that way. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, 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 exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's this, this one thing. Um, another uh, amazing uh, uh, thing that I, I, I guess you, you probably are familiar with, with the, the uh, E. Michael Jones and his. Uh, because you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, mechanism of social control. I mean, using uh, uh, sexua uh, sexuality, politicizing sexuality abroad, and, uh, and, and using it as a, me a mechanism of social control. Uh, and, and this is really amazing. Uh, when you really said that uh, there is no transatlanticism without uh, transgenderism, which uh, <laughs> I think really sums it all uh, sums it all up. Yes, yeah, so that. that that now replaces the pluralist room. Exactly. The pluralist of notions of transatlanticism without transgender. Exactly. And, and, and the third thing that you, that you mentioned was uh, uh, was this subversion of the of the America First uh, slogan, uh, saying NATO first. Because actually, if we remember, original Trump was saying that NATO was obsolete. Yeah. And I think he, even his policies of forcing European countries to pay more was actually in my opinion, I mean going back to the, the QAnon conspiracy and all that, uh, is that maybe he wanted actually to ruin the system by uh, by forcing these countries to implement policies that are not implementable because of their internal uh, of, of political issues. Because who's going to vote for two percent or four percent of, of budget uh, of Germany, which is a huge budget, huge country, um, for, for for military? Uh, so. Uh, do you think that his policies are already subverted uh, when it comes to the foreign policy, especially uh, especially the Middle East? Because uh, uh, what we see is uh, basically, I mean, even even uh, something that is concerning S Serbia uh, in particular is this um, um, ultra pro-Israeli um, policy, no matter what, and no matter what the other interests are. Uh, because I, I thought at the beginning that maybe. Uh, Trump will try to find a common language with Iran, not because they necessarily uh, like uh, the, the laws, but because they want to have some kind of a, you know, stability and consensus within uh, the region. And uh, and it seems to me that this is not happening. And, uh, and what do you think are the are the reasons for that? Is it is it the the, the, the elections or yeah, uh, uh, or what what might that be? Okay, if you can comment on all this, and then I will. Okay, that'll take another hour. That's, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's about the money. It's the mullahs or the mullah. It's, uh, it's something we don't really know. Um, yes, it was, it, it was subverted even before he got elected. I was in contact with people I knew on the Trump campaign back when he called Hillary and, uh, and Obama the founder and co-founders of ISIS. And I said, man, you've got them dead to rights there. And instead of the media all the what is he, crazy, crazy man, what is he talking about? And, uh, and eventually his team got around to saying, oh, what he really meant was he, that Obama pulled out of Iraq too soon, and that allowed a vacuum for ISIS to go. And I, and I contacted these people, what are you talking about? The Defense Intelligence Agency had a 2012 memo, which was released in 2015, showing that they, they knew that by supporting jihadist forces in Syria, they would uh, have a uh, create a Salafist principality in eastern Syria. That, and that was an inevitable result of their policy. And Michael Flynn was the head of the DIA at the time. I think he was trying to uh, to, to say, look, we're, we're, we're creating, creating a mess here. That obviously did not dissuade them. And later, I think he was interviewed on Al Jazeera, and he was asked, was this an unforeseen consequence of their policy? He said, no, it was desired. They thought they, so I said, you've got it, you nail them, dead to rights. They were the founder and co-founder of ISIS. They just dropped the communication. They wouldn't say anything about it. Because already, all the neoconservatives and the Republican retreads had taken over the campaign apparatus. And it was Yeah, and so and, and from the very beginning, all this plenty. So I, 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 yeah, I, was, I, I say it was hijacked from before day one. So there's there's no question about that. Um, what was the other part of that? Well, uh, maybe to comment something about uh, this uh, this uh, push on transgenderism as well. Oh, and then yeah. it became a part of, uh, of Trump's administration's policy as well, yeah. because Trump. Serbia is now part of the anti-oppression yeah. um, you know, and yeah. anti-coalition. Yeah, I don't know where that is part of the deliberate part of foreign policy and to what extent is simply a reflection of a, of a 
domestic pathology, which of course the Europeans are even worse than we are. Uh, and, and as I say, it's not just sexuality, it's race. I mean, there's, if you look up... Um, Only the Western uh, infidels. <laughs> yes, yes. If, if you look up, you, you can Google or DuckDuckGo um, uh, intersectionality wheel. There's a wheel showing a bunch of lines of privilege, similar to my chart, you know, sex and race and sexual orientation, language, etc., etc., religion. And this is being used for kids in school. They just single out white Christian kids and saying, so you are the oppressors. You are engaged in, in unconscious racism and sexism, homophobia and stuff like that. Which is racist it's, itself. Yeah. You're sure, you're no, sure. it's not, no, it's not, because only, only oppressors can be racist, sexist, homophobic, etc. Victims cannot be racist, etc., etc. And, uh, you know, this is being... Being done in school, it's been done in workplaces. Uh, you know, like even law firms. Well, there, you know, these people. What's this guy's name? Kennedy or something? Uh, he has the one of the, uh, and also that uh, D'Angelo, the mm -hmm. one with the, uh, um, I forget the title of her book. Basically, there's what they call critical race theory, where you may not have any kind of bad feelings toward anybody of any race at all, but because the structures historically have a racist basis, and everything in life is built on these structures, everything you do, say, or think is racist whether you know it or yeah. not. And Jim, please yes. add that D'Angelo insists that you cannot get rid of it. You cannot get rid of it. You will yeah. be yeah. a lifelong yes. racist and all you can do is repent and... And uh, you're still guilty. And, and confession and, does not absolve and, you. And, and <laughs> furthermore, she's now being invited by corporate America yeah. to yeah. indoctrinate yeah. people into yeah. this lifelong sense of guilt yeah. for which you have to keep atoning and atoning all the time. Yeah, yeah. and so this, this has become a really a kind of a religion in, in our country. And as far as the thing with uh, how, how did America first become Israel first or Saudi Arabia first and so forth, uh, I don't know all the details of how that happened, but it definitely happened. And in fact, this thing with you mentioned with uh, Serbia and Kosovo mm -hmm. at the White House, uh, the fake state, uh, so called state of Kosovo. It was very bizarre. It was about uh, Jerusalem. Uh, it, 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 it was, you know what it was? It was simply a photo op, it was a mini Camp David for Trump's re-election, saying, look at me, I'm the great peacemaker, and here's another great thing I did for Israel. It's as simple as that. It has no reality. They didn't even sign the same piece of paper. For yeah, right. sure. It was ridiculous. And uh, But I think sometimes people in Serbia would read a little too much into it and say, what were they really trying to accomplish here? Well, they already accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. They wanted that picture in the White House. That was it. That's all they wanted. for And it was all for campaign. And probably it, it didn't make that much difference because most Americans have no idea where Serbia is, much less where Kosovo is. Kosovo, yes, they in Serbia, so it's not really a problem. But still, they don't know. It's only because, ah, here's another thing for Israel. So that was the way it failed. Uh, okay, uh, so I'll take the question. But I'm, I'm sorry, because yeah. I have a very good information about, about how Israel <laughs> had a reception of what happened. So it was the uh, idea of recognizing the uh, call of Kosovo, yeah? Right, right. Uh, or the, Solely the decision of Netanyahu. The whole structure of the state was against the recognition of Kosovo. Mm -hmm. So uh, now the diplomats are in a very awkward position. And it's, pro and it's probably because Netanyahu wanted to help his friend Trump with the photo. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's a personal. It had nothing to do with Israeli policy. Because when we were when we were in Israel, I mean, we had very receptive audiences. As you know, uh, among the Likudniks, yeah. yeah, and uh, uh, not to forget that uh, why Israel didn't recognize Kosovo was uh, the basic influence was the conference that we had in mm -hmm. back, back in Sadat Sad Center, mm -hmm. because at that beginning, uh, the the key speech that Netanyahu gave about his future policy, mm -hmm. foreign policy when he came to power, was at the Beijing Sadat Center. So they influenced it very much in Bar and, and, the, and the rest. His initial decision not, not to originate Kosovo. So for 12 years he managed to do it, and now it was a, it was a, it was something something else. Netanyahu who wants to survive, yeah. Trump who wants to survive and wants to be alive. And there's another guy who also wants to. <laughs> <laughs> you you can't pick him up. The microphone can't pick him up when he's talking, so you want to. Your microphone will not pick up other people that are talking. Oh, they can go there. I, I, or I can repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. My name is Arza Pavlovic. I work at this institute. And I have one short comment and one uh, further question for you. Okay. Uh, the comment is that uh, when we read history, we tend to think
think of the, let's say, <coughs> American Civil War as starting in 1861, and you forget the whole pretense that lasted for 10 to 15 years. So when you think about the uh, first Civil War, as you call it, you, there was the whole uh, the French and Indian War before it, which changed the whole uh, structure of the colonies which led to this. So I believe that like this could be the pretense to something that uh, you mentioned, mm -hmm. something very ugly which is about to happen, and the pretense always exists. It's just that uh, you don't think of it when you read the history because you have exact dates when things began. So that was an interesting point from you, which I read into. And the question is, of course, unlike in uh, 1776 uh, or in 1861, the U.S. is a global power. So the events that happen in the United States have much uh, wider consequences. It's not just like a lo local continental issue. Uh, what happens if this ugly thing, as you call it, does come about? And uh, how will other major powers react to it? And where will they seek their interest and their new positions in this new world order which will uh, unimaginably come about if something like this happens in the United States? Whichever one of the scenarios that you describe happens. Thank you. And that's, and that's, I think, the real question for the rest of the world. Can there be a soft landing from American unipolarism, or does it somehow go into some accelerated drive, partly because it's in crisis, again, what we said about the Thucydides trap, that we may do something even stupider than we've done up till now to try to preserve our dominance because we can see that the, the timeline is against us. So we don't really know. There's the, the, the possibility that we might simply retrench and do so in a civilized and constructive way. And look, I, I think one of the reasons I think that's unlikely to happen is I think Trump really did want to come into office and make a strategic deal with the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, I don't know what it looked like, but I think he was thinking in those terms. That obviously is not going to happen. No such deal can be made, not with either power. And because we're ideologically incapable of granting legitimacy to a power we don't control. Which, if you look at uh, the balance of power that existed in, in, among the, the, the concert that existed in the 19th century, you know, Britain was, of course, the leading power among the European states, but she did not grant, she did not refuse to grant legitimacy to the interests of the French and the Germans and the Russians and so forth. We don't grant legitimacy to Russian and Chinese interests. To a, a somewhat minimal extent, we do to the Chinese because of their economic importance to us, but not even that to the Russians. And given the personnel, again, comes back to personnel, I don't see anybody who can come in and, and say, we need to find a balance of power, a reconciling of our lines of conflict, like, you know, the Wakhan Corridor between the British and the Russian Empire, about leaving Siam uh, neutral between the British and the French spheres. The, to even suggest that anybody in Washington is total heresy. Oh, spheres of influence. We don't accept spheres of influence. That's because there's only one sphere of influence, ours. And that's just the way it is. And I don't see how that changes. Thank you. Uh, first, Mr. Judges, thank you for coming. My name is Milos. We know, we know each other from Twitter. Yes, yes, I am Milos. Uh, I want to talk about ideology. Basically, the ideology that created America and the ideology that uh, mutated further, not, uh, basically it's liberalism, but the, 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 there is not, not just one liberalism, there are two, there's a right wing and left wing, what, what you call uh, small government and big government, tax, uh, taxes and whatever. But the point is that as the, uh, the story went down, and uh, America incorporated many, many more ideologies uh, from all over the world. Those two liberalisms uh, went uh, against each other, but at, at this point in time uh, are sort of uh, uh, mixed, mixed in together. They call neoliberalism today. But the point is that even with so much wealth that America has today, America doesn't, Americans don't have free uh, health care, Americans don't have free education, all, uh, uh, what we think, although we are, we are a more country here, what, what we have 
here is in, in many cases uh, considerable uh, for Americans. How can uh, such contradictions from basically how they see the world uh, from uh, from, from, from right wing to see uh, like that we need to abolish the state completely, no taxes, no nothing, we can have free market courts or free market police or what, and whatnot, and to left wingers who want to have basically a centralized state to destroy all, all hierarchies, and then we're going to have some sort of utopia. Both are utopian. Both, uh, both are going in the same direct, the direction, sort of. Uh, uh, Patrick Denis, I think you, you know who that is, mm -hmm. uh, calls them uh, two sides of, of the false yeah. coin. Yeah. Um, okay. Of course, there have been contradictions built into America from the beginning in the sense that if you read the Declaration of Independence, it's full of all this enlightenment rhetoric, very universalist in some ways. Whereas you read the Constitution, it's a very English document. It's a very concrete document to simply how we're going to rule ourselves. And there's always been this tension between the uh, very say, grounded, uh, I would say, ethnic basis to America, which is uh, based on English experience and the uh, ethos of that, that history versus the kind of, you know, LSD in the water in the 18th century of uh, universalism that we then saw playing out in the French Revolution and then that many of the revolutions of the 19th century. Um, the, 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 the tension between a very practical, hard-headed way of simply running a country and this kind of concept of popular sovereignty and a man can do everything he wants to do has always been there, and I, I don't think there's any way for us to escape it. But when you talk about the two different kinds of liberalism, there's, you might say there's a common ordinary day of li a libertarian kind of liberalism where in a free country you can do what you want pretty much unless you're hurting somebody else. And the kind of what we might call neoliberalism or corporate liberalism that's come to, to dominate America, which paradoxically has a very close relationship not only with the government, but a very close relationship with these so-called revolutionaries on the street. I mean, if you look at the the propaganda on race, sex, gender, et cetera, et cetera, from Antifa and from every fat corporation in America, they're virtually identical. So uh, in, in many ways, I think people look at these so-called revolutionaries as simply the shock troops of the, of the, you know, the brown shirts, the red guards of their corporate masters and the people in the NGOs and the other uh, points of influence that are trying to create a new woke structure, a new dictatorship uh, under the, but one that is not socialist in the old sense where the state ran everything. No, fancy, fancy socialism. And not only that, corporate socialism. I think we used to call that fascism. So it's, it's this kind of, uh, if you want a kind of uh, a of, uh, of, 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 you know, Bolshevism, critical race theory, uh, sexual pathology, and, and corporate power, and also putting curbs on the old-fashioned kind of libertarian uh, uh, liberalism, where you can't say what you want, you can't earn a living, you can't go get, go bank and get banking services, you can't uh, do anything unless you you know ra raise your fist and say I agree with the new ideology. But uh, isn't that in accordance with how libertarian sees things. Because if, if a bank is a private property, bank can uh, refuse any services to any whom he wants. It wants. So th this, is the, this is the thing of, of being a libertarian. You're basically enforcing the thing that, that, the, that destroys you. It, it, exactly right. And that's why I think many people are just now starting to wake up to it in America and say, oh, it's censorship that the government does it. But if Google or Facebook or somebody else says that that's not censorship because it's not the government. And I think there's two things wrong with that. One is the government is asking them to do these things. The government's saying police hate on your platform. Get the Russian bots off your platform. So there is a government hand inside the glove. And secondly, in a neoliberal structure, the corporations increasingly take over the functions of government and become the government. So it's not really a distinction, and I think a lot of libertarians who tend to be a little bit mechanical in their thinking on this, oh, it's not the government, so it's okay. It's a corporation, oh, that's a relief. 
Um, I think they're sort of missing the boat on this. I think a lot of other Americans are waking up and saying, government, government, it's all the same elites. They're all one incestuous uh, uh, organ of power. Can I just topic a little bit? Because okay, it's a very short, actually. I'm sorry, short you want some more? If you want short, short. Well, what you were basically telling us that America, from being a free country, is slowly evolved into a free country. Yes, yes. Basically. Yes, yes. Uh, when you were elaborating on the uh, de Americanization of Americans uh, and uh, the uh, deterioration of the social structure, there was actually a striking similarity to what was going on in Yugoslavia, especially the communist Yugoslavia and the Serbs. Yeah. You know, between the, the white Americans, European Americans, and, and the Serbs, who were pretty much guilty for all the faults, and then uh, being a Serb was a sign of being backwards, and uh, you had to sort of Press. answer if they asked you about you know, ethnicity in Critical some slot. sort of a, a apologetic way. Because yeah. Yeah, the Russians in the Soviet Union, even English. Yeah. 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 So, and the white Americans, Okay, far from being faultless, but you know they've been blamed for all, you know, the wrongs of you know that anybody, anybody can come up with, and they are pretty much by the fault of the guilty party. So if you could elaborate a little bit on that, because Serbian experience is very telling. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you or Serja, because of well, very very briefly, briefly uh, anybody who knows people from the former communist countries who lives in America today, many of them will tell you, I'm getting a very eerie and uncomfortable feeling of familiarity, yes. that we're getting to be a far, far less free country. There's a, there's a phrase, uh, soft, total soft totalitarianism, yeah. that's being used. They don't have to shoot you. They don't have to throw you into a camp. In fact, look, if you look at the same, late Soviet Union, very few, few people got thrown into jail. And they didn't shoot hardly anybody. It was mostly because they could deny you employment, they could deny your kids going to school, they could do all of these things. Well, those things were all on the table now. And, and you know, there's a new book by a guy named Rod Dreher, he's an Orthodox writer, the American conservative called Live Not By Lies. And it's mostly based on the communist experience in what we're seeing now in America today. So I think that's absolutely accurate. Uh, I would like to differ just on one uh, important point, and it is that in the communist system, the whole uh, mechanism of indoctrination was based on the Pavlovian carrot and stick. And uh, in the liberal postmodernia, it's based on the Freudian sublimation of, of thoughts and feelings. And that it is therefore more uh, subversive, more pernicious, and more damaging in the long term. And again, the illustration is, as, as you mentioned, how quickly uh, Hungary and Poland and East Germany recovered from uh, the four decades of Stalinism and uh, how terminally, not only uh, North America but Western Europe, uh, ter how terminally sick they are. And that uh, uh, the post-human form of totalitarianism, far from being soft or, you know, uh, in, in velvet glove, uh, has the capacity for more destructive and more terminal effects than the gulags have actually. Yeah, there's the same measure of deviation, but the, the, um, the you forget with the Bertolt Brecht thing from the 1953 revolt about electing a new people. Uh, at the end of three generations of communism, Russians were still Russians. Yeah. We won't be Americans that long because part of the program will be to import millions and millions of people who simply have no connection to the old American ethos and bring their own with them and also as separate little allies groups will be more easy to control. Uh, um, I'll give a phone to Lucia. What you were talking about, uh, about, about the recreating of society, it really reminds me of the mechanisms that the famous defector uh, uh, from KGB, uh, Yuri Bezmanov, mm -hmm. uh, used yes. to talk about. Uh, and he actually described the process that we are at the end of, in a way, in the United States. How first we will come with the professors uh, entering the, uh, the universities uh, that will actually eventually uh, deconstruct, uh, uh, in a way, the, the whole society. But now, uh, as, as you mentioned, in the last days with this transhuman uh, form, it might be a completely different being uh, than from what we are uh, used to mission for zero. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for everything. First, it's a great opportunity having you here, and especially since you're approaching to the November the 3rd, 
And uh, unfortunately, as many things around us are declining, that's how perception of the foreign politics and politics generally in our media and among our people, and even unfortunately intellectual, not to speak about political elite, is also in, in horrible shape. So this was really very, uh, not only inspirative, but uh, how should I say, some kind of, of uh, a very detailed uh, uh, overview of what is happening in America, which hardly can anybody offer nowadays in Serbia and in this part of the world in many ways. You know. But um, I wanted to ask about the two things. One is, let me say, more concrete, and one is more hy hypothetical, but I think I'm very interested also, and I would like to hear more perceptionally. Uh, speaking about this concrete stuff, which you didn't mention, this, this big section of, of, of uh, American society is, of course, the horrible institution which is called Supreme Court of Justice. And generally, judicially, uh, late uh, Robert Burke uh, wrote about judicial dictator already like 30 years ago. And uh, now it is really, how should I say, degenerating in some kind of tumor which is spreading around. He called that, you remember, American disease that is really going around uh, uh, in Europe and so on. But in America it really has tremendous uh, consequences. And uh, the, the point is mine uh, uh, is that at this moment you see that there is a big fight about who is going to be put within, you know, everything that Trump is doing nowadays. Uh, but the problem is that you never see that there is general consensus that uh, this is how it should be and it's about to stay. I mean, all these dilemmas and ideas to regain democracy back again from these uh, totalitarian judges, nobody speaks about that. Now it's only fight about who is going to put whom into a uh, Supreme Court of Justice, but generally uh, the, the position of judiciary is like, you know, some kind of clergy which nobody is uh, allowed to question and so on. So I would like to, to hear you about that, especially about the future that uh, the Supreme Court of Justice might have in, in America in the future. And another one is very hypothetical, but as you know, in Serbia, we really only like big synthesis and so on. Uh, very interesting stories, for example, and I think you, you could part probably find some, some corroboration for that. Uh, well, the story goes that since, I don't know, at least 13th century, you have some guys called like uh, black nobility or whatsoever who are, you know, having the control of the finances and the model, and that within every 200 years approximately, they are, you know, coming to some specific field, then they use that, explore that, and they were move forward within tax to come in here. So we know the story that went to, to Holland, then they occupied England, and it is called the revolution or, or the glorious revolution, and then they moved to USA. So there's a story that the same, how should I say, bunch of people all for it, however you want, now think that America seeks see that it's not your whittle anymore and it's about time to move to South China for example because there are some people who don't care much about freedom, they want to work, uh, there's a lot of them, they have uh, resources and so on and so on. So uh, when you put that from that perspective, I mean there would be ideal screenplay or scenario that America goes through some you know, civil war or whatsoever. And why, why I'm asking that? Because I, I heard that there will already be some, some cases in which some people from the elite are being accused that they transferred the voluntary technology to China and so on. And by the way, our, at our last tribuna here, Sinisha Lefoy, which said uh, that Russia moved after 120 years their birth from London to Shanghai. So what do you think about that? Uh, well, let me answer the part about the Supreme Court first. I'm sorry. Yeah. To answer, to answer, the, part about, to answer the part about the Supreme Court first, um, that for the last, oh, more than half a century, really, the Supreme Court has become less and less of a uh, judicial body and more and more of a super legislature, that they get to decide on the substance, the desired result of uh, uh, policy, what the law should be rather than what the law actually is. And this is now accepted, especially by the left, which has used them as a great vehicle for that, whether it's about race, about abortion, about uh, about uh, 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 same-sex marriage, religion, getting prayers on religion, on school, bill, all of that. Um, so, and they've been very reliable in making their appointees to say, and we're going to, 
appoint somebody to the court by a Democratic president who will give us what we want, and they get it. Whereas the Republicans say, well, we won't give us somebody what we want. We want somebody who will just interpret the law the way it's written. And then sometimes they get that, sometimes they don't, because they don't appoint somebody who would uh, give them what they want substantively. And if they did, they probably could not get them confirmed by the Senate. So there's been kind of a historical ratchet toward the left that never comes back. Now, with Trump appointing two and maybe now a third justice to the Supreme Court, and there'll be a big fight about this, but I think he'll probably get her confirmed. Um, even if she's confirmed, will the historical ratchet turn back? Will she, for, for, look, if you read Roe versus Wade, which is the opinion that legalized abortion, you can think whatever you want about abortion, but the Constitution doesn't have anything in there about that. It's not in the Constitution. The opinion itself is a joke. Even people on the other side will tell you that. But the court will not say, this opinion was a joke, we're overturning it, because that would hurt the credibility of the court. So they're more concerned about their credibility as an institution than the credibility of the Constitution. I don't know if that will change or not, even if this justice is confirmed. I would say this is simply part of the uh, corruption of a constitutional system that's been going on for a very long time and is now reaching the peak um, in what they call clown world. It just has no relationship to reality. As far as the other thing, if I understood your question correct, that there's this kind of these dark forces of finance, international dark forces of finance, you know, whether it's the, the Davos crowd or the Bilderbergers or the Jews or the Masons, or you can go down your list of whoever is Soros. So, yeah, Soros or the, you know, the yes, yes, yes. You know. So, but anyway. The Jesuits. I, 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 the Jesuits, yes, yeah. Templars. Yeah. Templars. Yeah. The, 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 the short answer is, um, I tend to think that it's not so much that there are organizations, there are definitely networks of power, there, that, that some of which are visible, some of which are not visible, and the people who belong to those networks of power, uh, I, I think probably have there are different aspects to them, different facets of them, where they come from, what their interests are, uh, and they're mostly interested in preserving their extending their power. Um, I don't know so much that there's organizations or groups that are that, that, have, that constitute this network of power, but rather the network of power tends to form these groups to carry out the interests of power to maintain their wealth and their privileges. Uh, um, I don't know that if that's something that will be decisive in the American context of what we're seeing in very well, maybe, maybe I don't know. Certainly, in, in the United States, financial power, as we refer to Wall Street, is very, very key to all of this. You know, we, we, you know, as you know, we don't even have real government money. We have essentially a private bank that controls our money. It's, 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 it, it, it may be a problem. Look, Americans like to believe everything in the world is a problem, and that all problems have solutions. And problems don't always have solutions. Sometimes they just blow up in your face. I guess that's a solution of sorts. <laughs> If there is no more, if there is no more, no more questions, should be. Yes, it's working. Um, Mark from Ohio. Ohio. It's just my seven-month-old son that's serving. Sure. Mark? Mark from Ohio, okay, but Mark. it's just my seven-month-old son that's serving. Um, uh, you've explained, it's not my question, over a number of years, you network, how the leftists, 51% uh, gains 51% to love war and they love humanitarian bombing. And there's nothing better than a humanitarian bomb in the world. Uh, but we don't have a good understanding of how people from our parents' generation, from born in the 30s, from the flyover countries, and the conservatives somehow got rid of, of this ethic that we had of peace and prosperity. How did that core of conservative flyover people lose that concept of peace and prosperity and built up this 49% of, of let's go bash down these other countries ethics uh, that, that comes from that segment that, that now uh, got taken off that the 51% came eventually from the humanitarian warriors how did the 49% of the we're, we're the best we're going to bash down the world where did that come from have you ever given any thought or any research to that um, or do you agree with me? Well, I, mean, I think you're basically right, and I think there are a couple of things. One is, I think this is a generational aspect. That is, people forgot, especially remember, in our country, 
it, we didn't really know what real war was. We weren't destroying the United States like other countries. We didn't really suffer the problem. We haven't suffered a real war domestically since the Civil War, and that was really only half the country that had fought on their own territory, right? So the idea of what a real devastation of World War II is like, or War I, it doesn't really register in the American mind. And then even more so when you get it attenuated from the memory of war, generation by generation. So I think there's a kind of a complacency. There's a writer, um, uh, Saker, he, he says that, uh, that with regard to Russia and America, that the, Ameri the Russians fear war and are prepared for it. The Americans don't fear war and are not prepared for it. That there's a kind of a cavalier attitude toward this kind of provocation toward the Russians and the Chinese. We're big, we're bad. What's the worst that could happen? Well, we may find out, stupid people, if you don't you know, start being a little, more, a little, a little less reckless. Um, as far as the humanitarian war, I think, again, that does tend toward the left because they're utopianists, they're, they're idealists, that they're going to remake the world by breaking eggs. And so you know, it's a, a humanitarian famine, a humanitarian bombing, humanitarian lies, whatever they might be, they're, they're happy to do that. And as far as the other 49% who may be the, the normal per, per, per people, well, you know, when you talk about left and right, you know, tend to, I tend to talk about the evil party and the stupid party. The stupid party is usually deceived. And uh, that one reason you have propaganda and the incubator babies and Rotchak and, and the Serb mortar bombing and the rest of it, you have to convince that 49% you're doing the right thing because these people are just so evil. And they buy they call the 51%. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add 49%? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that just the, the left, the globalist left, is utopian in this respect because there is also the neocon. Utopia. Who are who are they? Uh, they're uh, well, no. the Trotskyites. Uh, yeah, yes. the but it's very important no, no longer to be yeah, shackled by the left and right concepts because, after all, the neocons are as hostile to any notion of uh, of co national coherence based on inheritance and blood and soil and language and culture as any postmodern leftist. My, my question was related to the, to the culture of, of conservatives like my parents, like my yeah. parents' friends, who, who, who had that core of, of go, go get other countries and make us number one. And, and you're very good on the other side of the leftist, etc. But I, I don't understand how that built up. How did we lose that peace and prosperity? Uh, I, I, I think the short answer is they were deceived. They were deceived. And maybe there was some element of chauvinism involved, too. That, you know, they, they got a big head that, you know, we, we are the purveyors of all things good, democracy, blah, 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 and they, I, 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 don't, I don't have a full answer. Okay, thank you once again.